My name is Uwe, Uwe Rempis. I'm, uh, I've been working out with Lassar for 11 years. Um, since two years I'm on the KVG side, which, are, which is our regulator business, and I'm heading the fund management. Uh, I'm based in Germany, in Munich. And I'm say, the fund manager for our LaSalle ARAG fund. And uh, not sure whether, whether you want me to, to dig into that right, right I'm now. I'm going to ask you a question about that later, yeah? so don't do it now. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, yes, and I mean, the, the topic around, we'll come to that later, is certainly invest across Europe in strong and strongest cities and region, because that is where we think um, which drives occupier demand, uh, especially into office uh, in, in the real estate sector, but also into retail. So that is our underlying theme for the fund, um, which I'm happy to explain in a minute. Great, Richard. Um, hi, uh, Richard Dival. Uh, I head up the cross-border capital markets team uh, for the EMEA region uh, at Colliers. Um, I'm sort of there to sort of value add all our capital markets teams uh, by knowing all the sort of global, regional and local capital sources, uh, advising uh, international clients uh, whether they on their strategies, which cities to go to, what sectors to go through. So I sort of know a little about a lot um, in terms of <laughs> sectors um, and uh, obviously work with all the teams all around Europe, so have a good knowledge of, uh, uh, of all the cities around uh, Europe. Great, thank you. Yeah. Good morning to all. So my name is Guillaume Zurka and uh, I'm managing partner of Faro Capital Partners. It's a boutique real estate investment and asset management company. And main business lines are obviously to uh, assist and support uh, as an operating partner uh, international investors in France. Uh, also to help uh, mainly retail real estate investors, so the so-called SCPI, to invest in cities of influence. So I'm really happy to. Uh, to share that with you in, in the next moments, and also to uh, set up strate strategic partnerships between mainly French, German, and uh, American investors. Great, Hannah. Hi, I'm, I'm Hannah Corlett. I am director of Assemblage. Um, it's a urban design and architecture studio that I founded 14 years ago. Um, we are best known for projects in Iraq that include um, United Nations Habitat um, Economic Housing for two million displaced people from the Iraq war and we also won the competition for the Iraq parliament but we actually do a lot of work in the UK now um, including the new design district for the Greenwich Peninsula where we're the urban designers and one of the eight architects and we're doing um, master plans all over including Mayfair um, lately. I also teach an architecture and urban design course at UCL um, at the Bartlett um, that concentrates on historic cities of significance. Great, Peter. And I'm Peter Labour. I'm sort of giving the occupier view here. So I'm responsible for the um, EMEA tenant rep business uh, in Colliers International. Um, so I lead the teams across Europe, um, involved in most of these cities that we've been talking about here. Although I'm English and work in London, um, I've lived and worked in Barcelona and in Milan. So I feel I'm fairly European. Um, and. Uh, um, from my, from my perspective, you know, occupiers take a very different view of the cities to, than the investors. They're somewhat um, less flexible to be able to just sort of choose where they might go to. But we'll draw some of that out during the discussion. Good. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, let's let's start with you, Peter. Let's, let's just. I mean, cities have been yeah. influential cities. Have essentially a lot of them stayed there for centuries. Um, so. Do you think that is always going to be the case? The main cities were highlighted there also. We, we've got some surprises, some differences in terms of the tables. A lot of the main cities are just there. Do you think those are always going to attract um, occupiers, that people are always going to sort of flock towards those cities? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, clearly the main cities are going to attract the major occupiers. But I think what we're also seeing, and if you look in, if we look at, for example, some of the CE destinations, some of the secondary and tertiary cities in, um, you know, Poland, um, in Hungary, Czech, are they've, they've now got an increasingly educated workforce, particularly the Polish second cities, who are um, attracting. Um, much more of the back office type um, uh, uh, occupiers, but 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 much more than just a, an administ ad administrative use. You know, the, you know the, 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 the workforce that they have are cheaper, but highly intelligent, multi multilingual, etc. 
And um, maybe just coming to you, Uwe, j just give us a little insight in terms of the fund and, and how you structure that, because I think there's there's some interesting things in terms of how you're viewing cities and also the sustainability of the investment right. uh, because of that. Yeah, cool. thank you. Um, yes, as I just introduced, um, I'm running the La Salle ERG fund, um, and what it is, it, it's, a, it's a regulated uh, alternative investment fund. We started the fund in 2011 uh, with the underlying theme of ERG. Now, uh, what is that? It's um, trying to pronounce it correctly this morning. It's the uh, European uh, Economic, uh, European Regional. Uh, economic growth index, um, so which we published since 2000, so it's now in the 18th edition this year. And uh, what we do is we measure um, uh, across uh, 32 countries, 295 regions, 100 cities, really um, trying to identify where are the strongest growth regions and cities um, with, um, say, growth uh, with um, um, with wealth and the business environment. Um, so all these cities get ranked, and uh, our um, investment strategy is to follow to invest, say, in the top third of these regions. And then this gives us a, a, a nice a map across Europe with a rel still relatively large investment horizon. And then we're trying to sharpen this down uh, using filter criteria such as um, so is at the top third region, then it's also about <coughs> transparency that we just want to invest in really transparent cities. And then there are further filter criteria based on the sectors like office and retail, where we say office just really in mature office markets with a minimum size, and retail also with, say, cities at, at, uh, with, a, with a catchment area of at least 100,000 uh, um, uh, people. And the logistics is a bit outside of that because we believe that strong logistics has more to do with with traffic um, uh, lines, with um, um, with with uh, connecting points. So it's it's not as reliant on the index itself. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, and Richard, in terms of, I mean. In terms of Damien's presentation, when you saw that, were there surprises for you in terms of some of the cities? Um, and and is it does it kind of indicate where investment flows may be going? Um, do you think do you think there's a sense of that that some of these cities perhaps are becoming more attractive to occupiers and they may be moving up the investment table? That 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 somehow is signalling what may happen in terms of investment. Um, yeah, I, I mean when I when I first saw the uh, <coughs> draft research, it. Uh, Kind of shocked me actually. Um, <laughs> I thought Moscow number four is not going to be very credible. It might get thrown in the bin. Um, it's completely different from an investor's point of view. And uh, you know, I think the, the the German cities, for example, are ranked very low from an occupier's point of view. But that's because there's seven of them, and obviously the larger cities are really winning this. And it's to do with very low vacancy rates, so occupiers can't get there value in, in some of those cities. So um, I've, I've been trying to protect our German colleagues and uh, make sure that um, <laughs> we're not upsetting them. Um, but um, no, I, I, mean, I think uh, one of the things, uh, I was at a global conference in Toronto at the end of November and Juve's global head of research told me one stat which I was quite amazed by, which was in 1950 two thirds of people lived in rural areas and only a third in cities. And by 2050, it's going to be the reverse. So two thirds of people living in cities. And um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the cities of infrastructure, uh, sorry, I think infrastructure is a major thing for investors. So where infrastructure happens in cities, investors want to come in. So, you know, we're seeing in London Crossrail that's going to be opening this year or next year? Uh, 19, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Next year. Right, next year. So, um, you know, it's it's fine. the <laughs> amount of investment that that's creating and yeah. um, you, you look around, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure going on in Paris, there's a lot of infrastructure going on in places like Stockholm, but there's a real lack of infrastructure in, in, in Germany, for example. And um, it, But it's not stopping the capital flows going to Germany because the fundamentals are good. Uh, but I think uh, infrastructure in cities is a real key word for where investors want to go. Okay, good. Um, Hannah, I just want to pick that up from your side because you're obviously working with the municipalities, the cities. Um, what's your sense of that in terms of the need for infrastructure, but also are they thinking um, 
about the needs of occupiers, about the needs of investors? When, when they come to you to ask for a master plan, mm. what are they asking for? Well, they're often um, quite <coughs> economically driven for obvious reasons, but um, we have, I mean, for the Greenwich Peninsula, it's actually a private client who um, has either leased or owns the entirety of the peninsula, and that's a very different set of drivers than, say, the Mayfair Master Plan, which is, which is actually for a, a set of locals, but it's very much on an electoral role dealing with um, local authorities. Um, and the, the timescales that they look at are completely different. Um, the private clients looking sort of 20, 30 years return on their investment and the local authorities very much, I need to get something that is attached to my electoral cycle so it's within four years. So you look at something like transport infrastructure and it can't really be realised, you know, you might be cleaning up dog mess or, or something on a really <laughs> low voter pleasing level um, because it's deliverable but private clients are very much looking at um, all the key factors that makes a significant city because they're aware that actually in order to get a return on their investment you have to look sort of 20 years time and you actually have to build in, um, I mean one of the, the design districts actually for startups um, on the understanding that actually those startups will stay in the vicinity, they will become successful, they will therefore lease much um, more valuable property in, in adjacent areas, but they will also create a cultural hub that will attract people to want to live there because it's not a generic, you know, Starbucks um, location whereby you, you could be anywhere in the world, it makes it significant. So they basically have a lost leader in, in that because it's a long-term return for them. Um, and looking at my graduates, I see that that's very much a similar thing. Actually holding on to them, keeping them, um, means that they not only deliver in the workforce, but they're actually returning, um, becoming house buyers, um, becoming investors in the city. But actually that having the joined up thinking where the university talks to the local authority, talks to the landowner, that's very rare in our experience, unfortunately. Okay, um, and that's interesting, <coughs> that the, the point about creating um, technology areas or innovation areas. Um, and Guillaume, how important is that, do you think, um, in terms of changing how a city looks? I mean, it's interesting, we talked about Berlin, which is, you know, reinventing itself as an innovation, as a startup hub. Um, how much do those things influence the investment side? Yeah, I think there's uh, within the cities of influence. I would uh, I don't want to be too binary, but there's basically two uh, two baseline. The first one is there will be, as you mentioned, the uh, must-stop shop like London, Paris, or the top five German cities. Or you know, every large investor is going to be invested because you know it's a deep market. You have take up. Uh, uh, you basically understand the the data of the market, etc. And and the cities of influence for me are more the the dynamics that are emerging for which could be called maybe uh, secondary or tier two cities. So for example, Berlin, which you know maybe three years ago was not in the spot of many investors, has totally reinvented itself in the in the in the tech, in the well the startup sectors. Uh, it's even called now the Silicon Alley, so in relation to the Silicon Valley. So this is kind of amazing and with the um, mainly the French investors I'm driving to Germany, the idea is potentially to get, you know, uh, a flavor of these dynamics instead of just investing where the the market has, you know, is still uh, is still pretty steady, but I think you know as of now there's also two main things that are changing. Also, the fierce competition that are uh, among these uh, different European cities. The first one is uh, the political uncertainty that have shaped all around. So you have break, you have yeah, you have for country and also for city. For example, you take Brexit, you take the French election. So this is more for global country perspective. But inside that, you have also city's political perspective. Uh, the, the easy example is Barcelona and Madrid. So, you know, in relation to all that, you have also to basically navigate with different kind of investors in terms of that uncertainty. And also the second, you know, large uh, competition that uh, those cities of influence and gateway cities are delivering uh, themselves is also the, the wealth of talents. So, uh, and uh, apart from infrastructures, also the cities want to attract the best people. And you see that, for example, uh, let's take some uh, easy uh, example. Everyone in Germany was basically uh, working either in Frankfurt or Munich, which was a kind of dominant city. But now you have a lot of people, you know, working in Hamburg, working in Stuttgart. Uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, in France, a lot of people are moving to Lyon or to Lille. Uh, well, Maybe Italy and Spain is a little bit different, but this is some new scheme we're seeing, and you know, from a 
traditional uh, real estate investment perspective, you were basically just you know uh, going down. So one London, two Paris and the German cities, and then potentially you know uh, starting all around the uh, sales in Europe and uh, see. But as of now, it's very interesting the the, the dimension that uh, La Salle is uh, is doing on these cities funds and teachers uh, <coughs> is doing the same thing. But now it's just. You know, cities versus cities. It's 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 not any uh, any more country competition or you know large uh, um, headquartered uh, capital state uh, competition. So it's a uh, it's it's a brand new uh, way of uh, assessing real estate. And I think uh, obviously there will be uh, winners and maybe uh, not losers, but you know uh, some of uh, staying behind. But everything is really changing, and I think the, mo the, 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 the most important thing is to see the dynamics in relation to infrastructures, political, and also uh, what, what, what are the cities doing to attract talents from a you know, global perspective. I mean, and that's quite interesting, because I, I think in, um, in your analysis and, and the fund in terms of the strategy, you're also looking at those what might have been viewed as softer factors like human capital, like livability, um, wellness, those kinds of things. Um, how's that playing into the fund and is that is that really becoming a, a more important part of the investment strategy? I mean in general it's it's um, purely all about the strengths of the regions and of the cities. Um, and of course as you say uh, the, the human capital uh, is certainly an, an, an interesting and very important thing. Um, I think most important is certainly the question, how does the index correspond or correlate really to, for, for example, office take up? And we have interesting figures on that because over 13 years we figured the positive correlation of above 60% <coughs> to the three, year, three years rolling office take up um, in the market. So this is for us just a strong signal that there is a, a, a good, a very strong link between the index and at the end of uh, real estate performance. And in fact, I mean, we set up the fund, as I said, five, six years ago. We are now at um, uh, almost 700 million gross asset values invested over six countries with uh, 19 assets. So it's, it's already a, a well diversi diversified portfolio in um, office, retail, also logistics. And our performance over the last year has been really very strong with a total return above 6% and a cash return of uh, a way above 5%. So, and that is really comforting that we are well, well on track with that. And, uh, and Peter, in terms of the occupiers, obviously you've got changes in terms of how people are, are living, how they're also looking at office space. Um, if Google put an office somewhere, it immediately creates an interesting area in a city. Um, from an occupier perspective, um, are people beginning to look much more about, well, actually, this is where we want to be because that's where we're going to get the best young talent? Uh, yes, undoubtedly. I mean, occupiers, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, occupiers look at this in a very different way. They're much less footloose than investors. They can't just go. They're not just out there choosing different locations. They they, use, they, they will have a location they need to be in in order to access a market. Um, but they're certainly, the, you know, the Warfer talent that we've talked about certainly has uh, um, uh, has a, a, a great bearing influence on where they may want to go to. And so they will be looking at universities, they will be looking at the age range of people in a, uh, in a location, they will be looking at the, at the, the skills that are provided uh, in that location and how easy it is to recruit. And you, know, you mentioned an example you know, of, of a, you know, a large sort of anchor occupier moving and changing the, you know, the, 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 the nature of a city and that, that sort of thing is absolutely true, both on a regional level and then even on a local level if you looked at I mean you know we talk about London I don't want to bring it down to sort of small details you know you look at the changes in London that have been made by specific occupiers Google moving up to King's Cross or or um, the American Embassy and, uh, and Apple moving down into 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 otherwise sort of unfashionable areas but then just drawing everything else into it and all the other particularly technology companies, they're all the hangers-on that will follow and, and cluster around those big occupiers. So somebody like Google can almost create a location. If they're able to go into a particular location, so many other businesses will tend to follow to be close to that sort of occupier. And, and do you think, um, Hannah, in, in terms of uh, more flexible office space, those kinds of things, um, it may enable some of the, some of the cities who, according to the, to the analysis, are 
good cities that people want to go to to study, um, and across Europe as well, but then don't stay there. They then, after they've graduated, move somewhere else. Do you think there's more of an opportunity now as, as work evolves um, and how people access that, um, that that will change? And so some of these university cities will actually begin to grow more in terms of um, ha having more you know, maybe office more, more work there for the graduates as they come through. I definitely think that's the case. I mean, I think technology is at a situation now where, I mean, in our office, we have someone who works for us full time in Berlin. Everything's on the cloud. We share drawings, etc., remotely. Um, the need to be in a sort of daily commute <coughs> distance from a key sort of point of work or even your clients is no longer the case. So things like uh, how what the rent for your um, office is actually a driver as long as you're a train ride away from any meeting. But I think some of the key things that aren't, and, and it's the nature of data connection is, is that sometimes there's a disconnect and I think a lot of what the description of actually what the key driver is like, it being related to the Alps, doesn't come up in the data but you see it. Um, those, those connections, those key drivers I think are really important and I think some of the reasons that people don't stay in some of the key um, university cities is is, for example, diversity at the top. If you go to the university and you get a, a very big mix of religious, um, ethnic, um, gender crossover, and yet in within that city you don't. People people don't stay. Um, but it doesn't necessarily come up in the data. Um, and I think there is also a window of graduates being um, not driven by property prices, but driven by work. So if you give them work opportunities and they land in a city and they meet their partner, they don't necessarily want to move out. So um, actually understanding the sequence and the chronological sequence of, of what drives people um, and making sure that each step becomes um, accessible um, to them means that they will stay. <coughs> However, if you pinpoint different things and that um, and that those don't always meet everyone's needs, then of course they're going to they're going to move away. And I think sometimes it's the n lack of joined up thinking that is the problem, not necessarily the that you know the the disconnect um, at all. Can, can, can I just add to that and just say that when we talk Everyone about universities... Everyone is allowed to add to anything, even <laughs> yeah. We've all been very polite so far, but we don't need to be, so okay, yeah, go I'll, I'll be the first to be impolite. <laughs> so, but the universities are not just... It, it's not only about the graduates that are coming out and going into work. The universities also provide research hubs as well. And, and, you know, and, and if you look at, for example, the pharmaceutical and life science industry, Again, in the UK, it's very much focused on this triangle between Oxford, Cambridge, and London, and it's the university, it's the research that's done in the universities, in addition to <coughs> the availability of graduates coming out, which is another important aspect. Okay, good. Um, I wanted to pick up a little bit of the, 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 the risk thing, because you mentioned, Richard, uh, Moscow, but also over the past year you've had Istanbul previously, you know, for the ten years before that, have been a great destination for capital but also very fast growing, young, vibrant um, and then suddenly um, I don't know what's happened in terms of the, um, I don't know where it appeared on your slides. I didn't put it in. Okay, it was not <laughs> for a particular reason. It was, it was not as high as up, yeah. Um, but uh, I mean I'm guessing there that the space is still being filled, that that's still moving ahead but just from investment term that's just a no-go area I, I assume. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, everyone's learned from the global financial crisis, um, it's all about liquidity for investors. And obviously we're in a mature part of the property cycle at the moment, and, uh, you know, people don't want to get caught out buying in a secondary city where they're, they're not going to be able to sell uh, if the market turns. Um, I mean, I think, you know, Obviously, investors, uh, it's the fundamentals, it's whether they can get their returns. I mean, most of the international capital I'm talking to uh, at the moment is finding it very difficult to go into the gateway cities and get their returns. So, you, you've obviously got the people who come in and buy the trophy buildings, as we've seen a lot of Hong Kong money come in and buy the tower buildings in London. I mean, that's literally a global strategy. You know, if they can't find London, they're going buy in Hong Kong or New York, yeah? Completely different set of buyers. They're not going to go to every other city around Europe. Um, the others are, are going down the build to core route uh, strategy. And I think, you know, obviously in a low interest rate environment, that's a very attractive strategy. So turning it into core and selling it to the, the, the institutions, the retail funds at the end. Um, 
lots of money going into the alternative sector, so following the big urbanisation uh, demographic uh, sort of trends, so going into senior living, going into student housing, etc. Or well, they're going down the debt route, and I think um, that, 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 that that's quite an interesting play as well. Um, but. You know, I think um, you know liquidity is is a big issue for investors, and they only want to be in the liquid markets so they can get control of uh, exactly what they do. Um, one word we haven't mentioned yet, um, I think, is and I think Berlin's a great example for this is affordability. So I think um, for cities, I mean, Berlin is really winning because it's the cheapest major city in Germany, which is attracting the young people and the talent. So you know, I think Berlin has a population now about five. 0.3 million, so it's quickly becoming the third city of Europe after London and Paris. Um, it's but a lot more affordable. Clarify, this, is, this is not necessarily affordability of office space, this is more to do with affordability of residential. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of young people, even though London is such a magnet, they can't buy houses there. So, well, are they moving to Manchester? Are they moving to Birmingham? don't know, you know, we're, we're going to see that. But, um, you know, I think um, Berlin is so attractive for investors. It's been number one in 2016, 17, and probably 18 um, in terms of destination for capital. And I think it's because it's, it's becoming the engine of uh, Germany. It's becoming a major city. It's a lot more multicultural than a lot of other German cities. And it's where the young are going. And that's where the talent is. It's the tech and media hub of Germany. Um, and eventually you might get a new airport there. Um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, this is a big bet. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think affordability does does, does come into play. But um, for investors, liquidity is the big issue at the moment, and, and how they get their returns. Okay. And mm. Uwe, just in terms of just in terms of that, how um, can cities? become more influential, so can they take effective action that would move them up in your rankings and make them more investable? Um, things like Berlin, for example, has that changed from exactly the things we've talked about here where suddenly actually it's a place where people can afford to be and want to be? I think Berlin is a very, very uh, interesting example. Uh, as you said, uh, with, the, with the index we cover 18 years of experience of the cities. And if you look into Berlin, it was always in the lows in the, in the first years, but it has over the time now worked out really in the top ranking cities uh, in Europe, which is clearly to the dynamics which you described. So it's, it's uh, indeed very interesting also to learn that, say, um, rental growth in the office sector for, for Berlin um, at 6% over the next, say, two, three, four years is something which one can take into consideration. Uh, now whether it comes true, it's, it's something different, but at least it shows the dynamic. And uh, also, I mean, the, the average rental level has been uh, modest, uh, so there is certainly room to grow. And I just wanted to add another factor, because you said, uh, I mean, the affordability of residential, of, of living, that's one factor, but there is also uh, childcare, which is in Germany definitely an issue. Specifically, I mean, I'm working <coughs> from Munich, so for, for if you want to attract people um, and they, they plan their family, it's definitely an issue. Can you at least find uh, childcare? And it's, it's a growing challenge for families to get decent childcare. So it's affordability of, of living uh, in combination with childcare, again, which is in Berlin, I think, uh, just a perfect fit. But I think Berlin actually, um, many years ago, introduced three um, housing strategies, all that begin with M, that I won't pretend to pronounce because they're about so long, um, <laughs> deliberately to avoid gentrification. Um, and they're, you know, uh, landlords found them incredibly problematic, but it's understanding that actually if you can avoid gentrification, which, you know, systematically has kind of moved its way around London um, from, from the days of the city wall, um, you're actually in a situation where you maintain talent um, in situ um, because they can live proximate to their to, to their place of employment and, and they've done the long-term investment of actually restricting um, house rentals so that so that you not only um, sort of maintain the people who wish to stay and people who do well don't necessarily need to stay at a low rental but you've got a constant supply coming through so I mean the people the, the people who work remotely in our office live in Berlin because they actively choose and can afford to live there and it's an exciting city to be in but that's all policy driven by the state there's two things there's the gateway cities like London Paris 
and yeah, maybe Berlin is you know is going to be. <laughs> but the, well, the cities of influence are more. What are what are going to be the next cities that are you know be taking the the lead not on the podium but then uh, from place four to place seven in the next coming years and that's the main difference and I think those cities are you know betting on families as Uwe mentioned and uh, you know constructing uh, a global tissue that is not just focus and well uh, we need offices we need industrial etc and I think the way now uh, those challen challenger cities are constructing their future is more in relation to that because obviously you know you will have a lot of people uh, going to university obviously I think first in London then potentially Paris Germany or Milan and you know those places will remain the the head cities within their country etc but I think uh, maybe uh, digressing a little bit for the global discussion. For me, cities of influence are not the gateway cities because the gateway cities will always remain gateway cities. But as you mentioned, you're an Asian investors and you have to invest billions of uh, of uh, whatever currency you have. Obviously, you you won't go to uh, Stuttgart, you won't go to Lyon, or, because uh, as you said, you know they're also looking for liquidity. And if the you know uh, it's a more a turnaround strategy when you when you want to sell something, London is even easier because could you be uh, at the bottom or up? Obviously, London will remain a liquid market. Well, obviously, you will potentially lose some money <laughs> within the within this, but you can sell the asset. But for example, if you invest uh, as of now in uh, Marseille or Bordeaux or uh, uh, Duisburg or whatever. Uh, potentially, as of now, it's uh, you know pretty good dynamics. But if anything you know kind of uh, scary happens in the next, well, let's say one year and a half, two years, uh, well, even if your asset is you know technically uh, perfect, you have a strong rental. Well, you know uh, uh, those kind of markets are really deep, and no one is going to buy your piece of real estate, even if it's you know real proper. So I think you you're right to say this. But I think the discussion is more around those challen challenging cities and you know how can they get closer to the podium and that's very interesting because and in, uh, you know uh, there's very young real estate but then when starting real estate 15 years ago no one was taking attention about uh, the people who are going to live in the office buildings about you know the childcare about the family etc it was just uh, constructing uh, an office building uh, where it was the most convenient for the city for the developer for the investors and no one was really taking care of. Uh, and now I think the, f the thing is totally reversed. You know, the power is really in the hand of uh, the tenant representative and of the tenant <coughs> itself. And as mentioned now, with also the new technology uh, uh, thing, et cetera, you can, it's, it's changing everything. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we noticed this after the global financial crisis that, you know, everything in London, it was all location, location, location. And then suddenly, occupiers became building specific, you know, sustainable, where the amenities were, and this is what's created, that London's core has done that, you know, and, you know, when you see Google go to King's Cross and, as Peter said, you know, South Bank and areas like that, were, 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 which were just unfashionable areas, have now become their own hubs uh, themselves, and um, as I say, from an occupier's point of view, it's all become building specific rather than location specific, I'm seeing in cities. Okay, good. Any other questions? Hmm. Yes, quick one. Yeah. Um, we kind of touched on local decision making, um, and in relation to the UK cities, what impact do you think the decentralisation of power and the metro mayors are going to have on their ability to be more influential as a city? I think it's it's very much something that's coming up in Brexit too. I mean, the disconnect of voting, you know, the the the, the huge disparity of, of the way London voted versus a lot of other regional cities. I think the the, the decentralisation um, with local government is actually driving the need to meet very different voter needs in the, in those cities, and um, I mean I think economically, whether or not people have ha are are self sufficient um, with regards to their own city and can invest in in quite a programmed way to do with regards to their needs, um, and and how that works with. <coughs> how they individually contribute to GDP is something that I think local centres have been very positive about. But if you look at the figures, I mean, we just have to see how sort of London does, and we're talking about productivity. It, it could be very problematic. I, th I think it's actually the collective thinking. If we, if we are going to distance ourselves from the EU, and God, I hope we're not. I'm still got my fingers <laughs> crossed. Um, if we then start to decentralise, I think that the, then the, the, 
the socio-economic differences between, between some of those major cities are really going to come out. So I hope if we are going to s separate ourselves from the EU, we actually then unify a little bit more. Um, but I think the whole sort of decentralisation is trying to appeal to the, just the great disparity of, of voter thinking within the UK. Um, but I, I, I personally, I hope it's tokenism because I don't think that we are we as a country work in in the same way as France does as as iso isolated little um, uh, ec economic um, individual self reliant locations. We just don't operate like that. Good answer. Thank you. Good. <laughs> I've got one last question, which is just very quick. Which is um, so, which cities will be the winners? In, let's let's put yeah. into uh, let's let's just make it over the next two years. So between now and two years time, I'm uh, I'm not an investor. I'm looking at it from the from the Occupy perspective. Um, I mean, I think despite Brexit, London, you know, London does just keep powering ahead, and I think that. Um, there's, the, you know, we're seeing that we're, we're already seeing a move away from London. You know, London moving away from being just a financial hub. It uh, over the course of the next beyond two years, over ten years, the rise of technology in London is going to overtake financial services, and London is going to become a, a technology centre. There will be more people employed in technology in London than in financial services. And um, we've got there are some there is some data on that. Yeah. Um, so that's I think that's one city. Yeah. So when we lose some of the banking jobs, which will go to you know, which will go to Central Europe, will be replaced. Mm. Okay. So vote for London. I think Manchester is going to start to steal some of London's thunder, and I think Berlin continues to be a winner. Okay. London, Manchester, Berlin. Obviously, London, Paris will uh, still be on the top of the podium, but I think in terms of, uh, and this is the main uh, thing for the discussion here. Uh, obviously Berlin and I think also I suspect Madrid shall also take uh, a yeah. little mm -hmm. bit of uh, Madrid as well. of the mm -hmm. cake as uh, we didn't talk about this but you know in terms of uh, investing I think uh, well the values are you know in terms of heels are really at the bottom now and the the well the sole way to uh, you know to basically uh, get a little bit out of the pack is to see where the rental value are going to be the uh, the top. So I suspect in relation to that, Madrid and Berlin in relation to the dynamics of the demography and to all the, what the cities are doing over there, shall be the one uh, within the challenging cities, you know, really standing out of uh, the others. Okay, good. Richard? Um, I just want to give a couple of stats about London before I move on to the other cities that I'm doing. But, you know, London's GDP growth is bigger than the entire Netherlands' GDP growth. Uh, investment volumes is bigger than Paris, Berlin, Frankfurt put together. So mm -hmm. London is always going to be a winner. It's the major city of Europe, whether mm -hmm. we're in the EU or not, it's still going to be a global city. Um, but from investors' point of view, um, I don't think enough money goes to Stockholm and uh, Copenhagen. I think um, if you follow that urbanisation trend and infrastructure, um, and the quality of uh, talent and tech and uh, technology, life sciences, etc. Um, I think Stockholm is going to be a real winner. Um, it's traditionally always been the fourth largest market, Sweden, in Europe. Um, and I think uh, there's that perception that the locals are very rich and it's very expensive. But I think the fundamentals of Stockholm are very good. Um, giving a bit to Central and Eastern Europe, um, I think... Um, Everything's all about Warsaw and, uh, and, and, and Prague, but um, a lot of investors, the more opportunities are starting to go to Budapest, um, so that's starting to win, I think. Um, and I think for Southern Europe, as you mentioned, Madrid. Okay, good. Uh, you've obviously got in your hometown a view of the Alps. Um, <laughs> so are we going to vote for Munich? Um, I mean, for sure, uh, what you said, I think the most influential cities will remain uh, London and Paris, no doubt, uh, across Europe. But uh, I, I'm also positive about the main German cities, specifically Berlin, as we just discussed, but also Munich, with, uh, say, uh, good rental growth perspectives over the next years. Then I also think that Amsterdam may benefit from the entire Brexit discussion. So that's also on our list where we see positive rental growth over the next year, so it's an interesting market. Although, say, um, product availability and yields, I mean, that's but that's all over the place, right? From a yeah. pure occupier uh, perspective, uh, these are certainly very interesting markets. Great. And if you could join me in thanking the speakers, that would be great. Thank you.